Hello and welcome to a vodcast from La Trobe University. I'm La Trobe University's resident Time Lord, Matt Smith, and with me today is Dr. Julian Shepherd, a lecturer in Ancient Mediterranean Studies at La Trobe University. We'll be discussing the street life of Pompeii, how the people lived, how they worked, and the kind of things that they did in their day-to-day -day lives. We'll start with a bit of context about Pompeii. Where was it and why is it significant to us? Pompeii was an affluent town on the Bay of Naples. Uh, it was a relatively short distance from Rome, but it's in the area of Campania, which now is a very built up part of Italy, but in antiquity was a very lush, very fertile area. It was a place that could produce several agricultural crops a year. It was very good for viticulture. And a lot of Romans would have their big wealthy houses here. But there are also a number of towns like Pompeii. And of course, all these places were in the shadow of the volcano Vesuvius, which the ancients realized was a volcano, but it had been dormant for so long that they assumed it was extinct. And of course, all that changed uh, in AD 79. The exact date of the eruption is debated, but the date that we usually go with that's in our most reliable source is the 24th of August, AD 79. So around about lunchtime, Vesuvius started to erupt and it buried Pompeii and all the surrounding villas and towns. So, um, so this is a picture here that we've got uh, of Pompeii with the, the, the temple there in front and in the background you can see Vesuvius. So they had no problem building that close to a volcano. And in fact, they actually built closer to that, didn't they? They did indeed. And one of the problems is people still build right on the volcano today uh, around this area. But yes, the ancients really seem to have lined up their forum. You're looking here at the Temple of Jupiter, which is at one end of the Forum of Pompeii. And as you can see, it is perfectly aligned with that volcano. And if you imagine that volcano is much bigger with one or maybe two peaks on it before it erupted, then it really would have been quite a spectacular landscape. Okay, so we're discussing the streets of Pompeii today. And what kind of people were living in Pompeii? Well, unfortunately, the most we know about um, the people of Pompeii sadly comes from the very, very poignant plaster casts we have. Uh, people who died at Pompeii were buried underneath the volcanic material and their remains essentially rotted. But because the volcanic remains had hardened around them, there was a cavity there which can be filled with, well, it used to be plaster, but now we use resin. And you create a very, very detailed image of that person. We think, though, from this sort of evidence and the other remains in Pompeii, that we're looking at a middle class, affluent, mercantile population. Uh, there are some elite people in Pompeii, judging from the size of the houses. If particularly you go to the area of Pompeii known as, known as Regio 6, there are lots of very big, very grand houses around there. But on the whole, the very upmarket elite Romans probably would have stayed out of crowded, rather smelly, busy, noisy towns like Pompeii. And they would have had great big grand estates in the surrounding areas. And of course, we've got archaeological evidence for those as well. They were buried by Vesuvius as well. But nevertheless, we're looking at a busy, affluent place where most people are probably doing quite well. There's a lot of trade going on. There's fertile uh, countryside. Uh, Pompeii has good access to sea and maritime trade. So it's, it's a, probably quite a good place to live if you're a Roman. So if I'm on the road to Pompeii and I'm coming towards the outskirts of it, uh, what would I see if I looked at the city? What would be before me? Well, one of our problems with the landscape at Pompeii is that it has changed radically due to the eruptions of Vesuvius. And one big problem is, of course, the eruptions with all the volcanic matter that has come out has pushed the coastline much further out. So in antiquity, Pompeii would have been a lot closer to the sea. And it might also have had a river port as well. We're not entirely sure what the route in antiquity of the Sarno River was. But that might have been important for Pompeii's trade access also. But if you're approaching the city from whatever direction you came in, you would walk through the cemeteries of Pompeii because like any ancient city, uh, the dead were buried outside the city, well away from areas of habitation, uh, also well away from sacred areas. We're used to the dead often being perhaps buried in a churchyard, say, or in proximity to a church. The ancients kept the sacred and the dead 
a long way apart from each other. Now, this could often be quite a social experience because, of course, if you walk up the main roads to the gates of Pompeii, some of the tombs there are very grand. So you could be impressed by the wealth uh, and the high status of the former inhabitants of Pompeii, but the members of their families who would still be living, of course. Also, as you approach the walls, you would see quite an impressive set of fortification walls that were also rather battered looking. Now, Pompeii is an old city. We think of it as the Roman city at the time of the eruption of Vesuvius, but its history goes way back, at least to the 6th century BC. And the walls of Pompeii were serious pieces of fortification and they were needed from time to time. And that was particularly true during what are known as the social wars, uh, which happened in the first century BC. And that was when Pompeii and a number of other cities in this part of the world were socky allies of Rome. And they rebelled against this, um, bizarrely not because they wanted to be free of Rome, but we think because they wanted to be more Roman. They wanted to have all the full rights of Roman citizenship rather than the disadvantages without the advantages. So we get the social wars. Uh, Rome, of course, won, but Pompeii did too, because it did in fact become a Roman colony. But the walls of Pompeii, as you can see here, still show signs of that siege because they're pockmarked by the signs of Roman artillery. Now, by the time Vesuvius erupted, there was no need for fortification walls because Pompeii is in the Roman Empire. There are no enemies as such. So that's the point where we get a lot of uh, the richer people in Pompeii building very grand houses up on the walls, which are no, no longer needed for fortification. And these houses often have the best views over the sea, over the landscape. Uh, they have beautiful terraces, so they get the cool breezes. And they must have been rather nicer houses to live in than some of the smaller establishments buried deep um, in urban Pompeii. Right, right. So if, I, if I'm a trader and I'm taking my cart to Pompeii because I want to sell whatever I've been growing. I go through the, the gates. Uh, what's the layout of the city like? When I, when I go through there, what do I see on the streets? Well, one of the advantages about a Roman town is that if you were coming in with your goods, and if you were traded with a cart, by the way, you could only come in at night. Roman towns were closed to wheeled traffic during the day. Is that just for street congestion? Yes, more or less, yes. Yeah. So you would have to wait it outside the gates until night fell, and then the big gate would be opened and you could bring your right. cart in. And then, because Roman towns are usually laid out in a grid pattern, the main gate, the main drag, would usually lead you somewhere like straight to the forum, somewhere central where you could conduct your business or find out where you needed to go. Now, Pompeii doesn't have an entirely regular layout. The area around the forum is actually a bit more higgledy-piggledy, which suggests that might be the very oldest part of Pompeii. And that is, in fact, where we find uh, things like the 6th century BC remains. If you go further out in Pompeii, you'll find that the rest of the city is laid out on a grid pattern. And this is a system that the Romans probably got from the ancient Greeks, but they applied to a lot of their town planning. It's a very rational, practical way of organising your city. And this grid, these grid patterns were laid out certainly by the 4th century BC and probably rather earlier than that as well. But Pompeii inside its walls was never completely built up. We have evidence that there were still open spaces for things like vineyards or market gardens. So there was a bit of agriculture and open space inside the city as well. So tell me about the streets themselves. So they had cobbled surfaces and, um, and there's indications that you could only go one way with the carts as well, isn't there? There is. If you have a look at uh, the streets, um, you'll see that often they have quite serious uh, wheel ruts in them for example, like this one. Now, the study of the direction of the abrasion on these wheel ruts can tell us whether these streets had one-way traffic or two-way traffic, which I think is a fascinating insight just into everyday life um, in ancient Pompeii, because, of course, the streets are often really quite narrow. And, of course, if you had wheel traffic, you have to have... Uh, a regular track on your cart. Those wheels have to be a set distance apart because you're also not going to get through the other big street hazard in Pompeii, which are the stepping stones of Pompeii. 
Now, these are fairly regular um, features of the street and are quite important for really practical reasons. Now, the streets of Pompeii would have been awash with muck for much of the time. Pompeii has no underground sewerage system. It does have a few cesspits, but essentially a lot of the rubbish would have gone thrown out into the streets. And so you really would have needed those stepping stones just to get across all this absolute muck uh, that would have been in the streets. And you're essentially reliant on the natural slope of the streets and also the rainfall in order to wash away a lot of this rubbish. So I'm in my cart with its regulated wheel mm -hmm. size and wheel distance apart. How do I find my way around the streets? Is, there, is it well signposted for this kind of place? Pompeii isn't signposted at all, really. Mm. Um, when you go around Pompeii today, you'll see lots and lots of signs, but they are all um, entirely modern. Uh, we think that probably the way you found your way around Pompeii, if you're a stranger, uh, was the sort of way that is actually often described in biblical stories where a stranger turns up in town. And that is, of course, some places, some streets might have had some kind of name. For example, we know uh, from evidence from things like graffiti that what we call today the Herculaneum Gate at Pompeii uh, was probably known as the Porta Saliensis, the Salty Gate, because it was near a salt works. But there's no sign on that gate saying Porta Saliensis. So when you arrived, you might have used a method that is, often occurs in biblical stories, but we use today, and that is simply to ask directions and you would be given a set of landmarks that you might use. So Second Street on the right, uh, past the great big temple, something like that. But what we also see in Pompeii are sets of little smaller images that might have been used as some kind of signposting system. So for example, in this slide, you're looking at a street corner which has a modern sign on it telling us the regio number, regio number three, and the block number, the insular number, insular number four. But below that, you'll see set into the wall a little terracotta plaque. Now, there are lots of these little plaques all around uh, Pompeii, and they show all sorts of images, sometimes um, vegetation ornaments or faces, uh, a lot of phallic ornaments as well. And we've got to remember that phallic symbols in antiquity didn't have the sort of pornographic connotations that they tend to today. And around the streets, they would have been symbols of prosperity and fertility and virility. And, and that's one we're looking at here. It's actually um, a penis with legs. Um, right. A, a, perhaps an unusual sign for us today, but, but not so unusual in the ancient world. No, mine's always trying to run away from me. <laughs> so go up the end of the street, turn left at the penis with legs. Exactly, yes. Okay. And then it's three doors down on the right or right. something like that. So these could be used as ways of finding your way around Pompeii. And there might be other little signposts as well. Go past the penis with legs and then when you get to the house with the cave canum the beware of the dog mosaic then you're in the right place right so it, there was probably quite a sophisticated system of finding your way around so um we uh, we, we had the the, the stepping stones before, how is, yes. how is water managed in the city? How is that distributed around the place? Well the water management system in Pompeii is, is a very interesting one. Um, we have a uh, a set of street fountains. Now, these are not an original part of the landscape of Pompeii. Uh, up until the first century BC, the Pompeians would have relied on cisterns. They would gather water from their roofs and drain them into cisterns and also wells for their water, which was probably not very nice water. We're in a volcanic area, so it probably would have been quite sort of sulphurous. Mm. Uh, but in the later part of the first century BC, Augustus, who was ruling the Roman Empire at the time, built an aqueduct, the Aqua Augusta, and he built it, actually it was going to Messinum, uh, which is north of Pompeii, where the imperial fleet was stationed. And his aim was to provide the imperial fleet with more high quality water. But Augustus uh, very conveniently put a number of spurs onto his aqueduct as well, and one of them went to Pompeii. So from the first part of the, uh, from the later part of the first century BC, Pompeii was also supplied with aqueduct water. And that's when we get these street fountains being built. And they flowed continuously. 
So this would have been also another way of cleaning the streets of Pompeii. The water coming out of them would have washed them uh, constantly. But also they would have been very busy social places. People who could not afford to have their houses hooked up to the main supply would have met here regularly to collect their daily water. And these street fountains are scattered all the way through Pompeii. Now, we also have other evidence of the water distribution system. The Aqua Augusta came into Pompeii in the northern part of the city, at the highest point of the city, and the water was stored in what's known as the Castellum Aquae, which is a great big water cistern. And the water came into this cistern at very high pressure and from there it was distributed throughout the city. Now, if you look at the Castellum Aquae, it has three outlets at the bottom of it. Now, this is something of a mystery because we'd like to know more about the piping around Pompeii to work out exactly what happened to the water when it left the Castellum Aquae. Now, there are a number of possibilities. One is that these three outlets could simply be piping to three different sections of town and then the water is redistributed from there. The other possibility is that each outlet supplies a different type of water source. And those three types would obviously be the public fountains, uh, the houses that were connected to the main supply, and also the bathhouses, because of course public bathing was a very important Roman activity, a social activity as much as a hygienic one. Now that has a practical advantage in that if you've got a water shortage, you can shut down the public baths and also the supply to private houses and simply keep the essentials, the public fountains open. On the other hand, with a system like that, you've got to duplicate a lot of piping around Pompeii. So it'll be interesting to find out a bit more about where the pipes actually went in Pompeii to work out how the water was distributed. But it, it was a big advantage uh, to the Pompeians to have better quality water and more of it as well. So how did they get rid of the water that they didn't want anymore? Or... Well, Pompeii didn't have an underground sewage system and so a lot of it would have been used to flush down the streets. Um, if we go to somewhere like Herculaneum, Herculaneum did have quite a sophisticated underground sewage system and you're looking at uh, a street in Herculaneum here uh, which you can see doesn't have all those wheel ruts and doesn't have as many stepping stones as those in Pompeii. The stepping stones weren't perhaps quite so necessary because there wasn't so muck, much muck in the streets. As far as the wheel ruts are concerned, um, there are several possibilities there. One is that we're looking at a rather more upmarket area of Herculaneum here. Perhaps there wasn't so much wheeled traffic. The other is a much more practical reason, simply that the streets were repaved more, more recently before mm. the eruption of Vesuvius. But we do have quite a sophisticated underground sewerage system there and you can see also a view here down into that sewerage system. And fairly recently, over 700 sacks of waste from the sewerage system have been excavated and they're going to prove absolutely fascinating in terms of things like the diet of ancient Romans around the Bay of Naples. And also uh, because the detritus has sort of accumulated in piles under particular buildings in uh, Herculaneum which had access chutes to the sewer, we can also correlate the sort of waste that came out of a particular establishment perhaps with the function of that place. So for example, the sort of household waste you get might be different from the waste you might get from some sort of industrial establishment. And you can also tell maybe the people under the rich house what they're eating and how much better it is than the people under maybe the poorer houses. Yes, exactly. It gives us a huge amount of detail into diet and also disease because a lot of um, pests and things like that can be contained in this kind of mess as well. And animals and all sorts of things and artefacts, of course, you know, things like broken crockery would be thrown down into the sewer. The ancients also had um, to some extent some control over it. Um, the other top slide here on the right shows a water tower in Herculaneum. Now Pompeii had these two. They would uh, lessen the pressure, they would regulate the pressure of the water as it came out of the aqueduct. But this particular water tower actually has a sign on it preventing the dumping of rubbish near the water tower. So there was some sense that you needed to keep your water supply clean. And the punishment is a fine if you're free, 
and a flogging if you're a slave. Right. Okay, that's a bit of a distinction there. So uh, what sort of things were people eating in Pompeii? What sort of diet did they have? Well, the people in Pompeii and also Herculaneum seem to have actually had a very good diet. Now, one of the problems is that we don't have a lot of skeletal evidence because the Romans cremated at this time. But at Herculaneum in the 1980s, uh, over 300 skeletons were found on the ancient shore, people who had been trying to escape by sea. And that provides us with absolutely critical skeletal evidence. And their diet appears to be very good. These were healthy people, on average taller than some modern inhabitants of Naples. So they seem to have had a diet that was uh, based on lots of fresh food, there would have been some meat and some fish as well. The area of Campania, as I said, is extremely uh, fertile, so it would have been readily available. But these are cities with good trading systems as well. So they would have got exotic goods in from further afield, from all over the Roman Empire. Expensive goods like, for example, pepper, which was one of the most expensive and exotic spices mm. uh, in the ancient world. Now, we have um, some evidence also of uh, where uh, you would go to buy your food. So, for example, this is a view of what is known as the Michelum or the built marketplace uh, in Pompeii. So this is a permanent establishment for the selling of food, probably mainly uh, meat and fish in this particular case. And in fact, uh, in one section of the Michelum, an awful lot of fish scales were found. So we assume that was the area uh, where a lot of fish was sold. Uh, you uh, might also uh, wish, if after you've been to the market, wish to check what you had bought to make sure you hadn't been diddled by a storeholder. And that was something that was highly regulated by the Romans as well. So once you let, left the market, say with your bag of flour or chickpeas or whatever it was, you could go along to the set of public weights and measures in the forum. And you're looking here at the set of public measures, which are a series of uh, cavities cut in a stone, and each cavity corresponds to a particular measure, and you could pour your goods into it, check you'd been given the right amount, uh, and then through a little hole in the bottom you could uh, tap them out again. Was there a lot of cooking going on in Pompeii in people's houses? No, not such a lot actually. Um, we have um, relatively little evidence of kitchens. Now there some is evidence of that in the bigger houses, but often even these kitchens seem to be quite small. Now a lot of cooking might have been rather informal, perhaps done over a little brazier or a little fire, but it was also a relatively expensive process because you need to have the space, you need to have the equipment, you need to have the fuel in order to cook. So we think perhaps for a lot of Pompeians, when it came to actually cooking food, they might have uh, either done it somewhere public um, in a bakery perhaps, and that's something we know from the 18th and 19th century in the modern world where people would take their meat to be roasted in a bakery in the big oven. Or you might get what we might call the takeaway. So you might go somewhere here, for example, Pompeii is littered uh, with bars and tavernas that would have served wine, but also uh, food of all sorts. Now, if you look at the counter of this particular bar, you'll see it has great big uh, pots known as dolia set into the counter of the bar. Now, it's not always entirely clear what these were used for. They might have had wine in them, but many of them, when they're excavated, seem to have dry goods in them, things like beans and peas, that kind of thing. So you might have bought that kind of material here, but also uh, you might have got your takeaway of hot food, um, which might have been just some sort of vegetable porridge kind of a thing. It wasn't necessarily very grand, but these were good sources of food supply. Okay, and uh, there were bakeries as well, wasn't there? There were large bakeries. Where there you were get large bread bakeries. From. Pompeii is absolutely littered with bakeries. Uh, so bread was clearly an important part of the diet of Pompeians. And in fact, uh, it inter it's interesting that just as today, bread came in different qualities. So for example, we have a shopping list from Pompeii that includes items like bread, but also bread for the slave, indicating that perhaps the slaves got the kind of grittier, rough nastier, cut. cheaper, yeah. rough cut bread. Exactly. Now in Pompeii, we've got bakeries and some of them have mills in them as well. And you can see a set of these mills in this picture here. And this is a bakery where 
the grain would have been milled and the flour produced as well as actually turned into bread. Not all bakeries had them, but, but some, many of them do, as in this case. One of the interesting voices that are left behind by the people of Pompeii is the graffiti that they leave on the walls. You can see it on the buildings and on the sides of the street and everything. Can you tell me a bit about that? What did that tell us about the people? Pompeii is absolutely coated with graffiti and there would have been a lot more. Unfortunately, a lot of it's gone in the early excavations or has faded. But the graffiti tells us all sorts of different things. Some of it is obviously quite official. It's done by professional sign writers. It's on the walls of private houses and it's to do with electioneering. So we presume that this sort of graffiti was not only tolerated but actually encouraged. So you might promote a particular candidate for political office, and that of course might be yourself, on the walls of your house or houses of your friends. A lot of it was less official, of course, as well. Um, graffiti, just people scrawling on the walls, just doodling, writing obscenities, all sorts of things, just as they do today. But a lot of it in Pompeii also gives us an insight into other aspects of the social life. So, for example, a lot of the painted graffiti might be advertisements for upcoming events, uh, games put on in the amphitheatre, for example. Um, a lot of it is also advertising in a sense, I suppose, trade. Um, <clears throat> and that includes, for example, prostitution. So we know uh, of one Novelia Primogenia, who was a prostitute at a place just down the road called Nuceria. But she obviously got about a bit, or at least wished to advertise quite widely. So we have graffiti in places like Pompeii saying, go to Nuceria, ask for Novelia Primogenia uh, at the Vicus uh, Venerius near the Rome Gate. Uh, that kind of thing. It's interesting actually her name, Novelia Primogenia. Primogenia means firstborn and that sounds like a bit of an aristocratic name. So poor old Novelia's family might have fallen on hard times and she had to fend for herself in other ways. Could have been a stage name. Maybe a stage name, yes, who knows. Um, we, can't, we can't tell. But uh, she obviously uh, knew how to advertise yeah. and, and to do some bit of marketing. We get all sorts of unofficial doodles. Uh, for example, this is an absolutely charming little graffiti in the Villa of the Mysteries, which is a big, uh, rather grand, but nevertheless working farm villa just outside the gates of Pompeii. And at some stage in the atrium, uh, somebody scrawled this little caricature on the wall scratched it into the wall of a bald guy with a very big nose and a, kind of a saggy mouth, so maybe he's lost his teeth. And above it, it says Rufus Dest. This is Rufus. So we don't know exactly who Rufus was, but somebody was having a go at him in the Villa of the Mysteries. And that's actually inside the Villa wall. It's on one of the internal walls as well. It is inside the Villa wall. It's only very tiny. You have mm. to look closely, uh, but it is. Now, Quite who did it or what the owner might have said, we don't know. Maybe they were planning to redecorate so somebody was just having a bit of fun before they repainted the atrium. Uh, but we get all sorts of things at all sorts of, uh, all sorts of odd places. Um, and in fact, some recent uh, studies have looked at the height of the graffiti in Pompeii. And there's some of it that is at a very low level on the walls, which might suggest that it's actually been done by children, not adults. So uh, tell me about the, the brothels in Pompeii, which is an, another aspect of life. And uh, were there a lot of them around the streets of Pompeii? One of the problems with Pompeii is calculating the number of brothels. And depending on which study you're reading, you'll have anywhere from maybe about nine to 35. Now, part of that problem is how you identify a brothel in the first place. Um, there are some structures that are clearly brothels. But others might be just little one-room structures off the street. Maybe they've got some kind of built-in bed, but is that a bench? Is it where a poor person lived? Was it some little kind of workshop? We, we can't always tell. Uh, of course, you don't need a purpose-built structure for these kind of activities either. So we hear, again, from a lot of Roman texts that uh, prostitution might take place in secluded areas like outside the city gates or around the tombs at night, somewhere like that. Where we can clearly identify brothels, though, they seem to have been a bit off the main drag, quite discreetly placed. And you're looking here at the rather narrow back street, the little alleyway that goes down to um, the best known brothel 
um, in Pompeii. And so you can imagine that if you were a Roman and you'd done your business in the Forum, perhaps on your way home, you might scuttle down this alley um, for a quick assignation uh, with a prostitute. It's, uh, it's the most well restored building in Pompeii as well, from what I could see, and there were quite a lot of foot traffic going through it as well. It's probably certainly probably the most visited mm. um, building in Pompeii. And um, it, it's, I guess, something that makes Pompeii quite notorious. And even up until the 1970s, women were not allowed into the brothel at Pompeii in case they somehow became corrupted. Uh, but this is quite clearly a purpose-built brothel through its design. It's got a bunch of small cubicles uh, with built-in beds. Uh, they're rather uncomfortable looking concrete beds now, but they would have had mattresses and cushions and so forth on them. And there are some inspirational pictures as well that describe the sexual acts quite clearly. So there's, there's no doubt that we're in a brothel here. And the Romans were really sensible about prostitution. They knew it was going to happen, so they regulated it. You had to register with the aediles, with the magistrates, if you're a prostitute, and you also had to pay taxes. Now, Pompeii, those taxes were judged by the sexual act and they seem to have been on a sliding scale from two asses to 16 asses. And when, one you, wonders, when you say asses, what sort of audit's going on there? Oh, an ass is a very small denomination. It's a small coin, okay. a small amount denomination, of money. Denomination, yes, right. Yes, it's okay. a denomination, okay. yes, yes. Um, one wonders how on earth... You filled out your tax return if you were a madam of a Roman brothel uh, or indeed how the Edals, the magistrates, audited your tax return. Um, but as I say, the Romans were always keen to uh, gain income from anything they could and they were sensible about this, so it was taxed. And also in Roman law, an affair with a prostitute was not adultery. It was something separate. Now, this meant that prostitution in many ways was quite important for the Roman social fabric because men could go to a prostitute and while that wasn't exactly condoned, it was frowned on to an extent, but it wasn't absolutely socially unacceptable. Far, far worse to have an affair with, say, the wife of one of your peers, which could really disrupt the social fabric of the Roman world. Right. So... Um these, uh, these paintings that are above the, the doors here, which illustrate um, maybe some of the acts that you could get in there, they weren't just found in brothels, though, were they? No, we get them in all sorts of odd places. Um, famously, there's one in a little um, back room off the kitchen of a house known as the House of the Vetti, which we think was owned by a couple of um, rich Pompeians, though not necessarily very upmarket ones. We think they're probably ex-slaves. Uh, freed slaves could often make a lot of money in the Roman world. But perhaps the most notorious uh, set of um, pornographic images comes from a rather elaborate, really rather upmarket looking set of baths just outside the marine gate at Pompeii, known as the suburban baths. And these images are absolute shockers, actually. They, they make the ones in the official brothel look quite tame. These are really triple X rated. And there's a big debate as to what might have gone on in these baths. Did it operate also as a very high class brothel or are we looking at something else? And if you have a look at this image here, um, you've got a row of um, sexual images at the top that show all sorts of things, um, threesomes, um, oral sex, the works. But below that, you've got what look like a set of boxes with numbers on them. And these images are in what's known as the apodeterium, the dressing room of the baths. So we think there's probably some kind of locker arrangement uh, here. Um, and this might have been some kind of Roman joke, a way of remembering which locker number you'd left your towel in and your day clothes. Um, you know, oh, yeah, my locker is the one with the... With the two guys and one woman, you know, having it off together. Yeah, yeah. So it's like when you park your car now in a car park, you parked in orange too. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, a, a way of remembering. Or how small children, when they go to kindergarten, can't remember the hook number for their coat, but they have a little dog picture or something. That'd remember make you them. remember. It would, it would. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what about the more conventional sorts of entertainment? Well, that would have been conventional back then, but uh, things like there's a big arena yes. in, in Pompeii. Tell me about what would have been going on there. Uh, Pompeii's got a great amphitheatre, and in fact, it's our earliest extant amphitheatre. It was built probably in about 80 BC. Now, that's when Pompeii became a Roman colony. 
and we get Roman veterans being settled at Pompeii. So there might have been an extra need to make Pompeii look more Roman and provide Roman sorts of entertainment. Um, up until about this period, um, we think that the sorts of events that went on in amphitheatres were either held somewhere else in some other public space, Forum for example, or that amphitheatres might have been temporary structures. But then we start to get these permanent ones. And the Pompeii Amphitheatre is a relatively simple affair, but you can see here from the slide we've got a big oval-shaped arena surrounded by raked seating. And this was the venue for some of the sort of yuckier types of entertainment that the Romans seem to have enjoyed. And that might be staged wild beast hunts. It could be execution of criminals. Uh, it could be uh, gladiatorial fights. And that would involve gladiators who were slaves, but also trained fighters uh, pitted against each other, often in a slightly um, unfair kind of a way. Uh, they'd be given um, weaponry that was very different, for example, uh, just to spice it all up uh, a little bit. And these would be affairs put on often by the rich inhabitants of Pompeii in order to gain political favour and popular support. And they might have not just a very fancy set of gory games, but also add-ons. For example, uh, what's known as a, a velarium, an awning, might be stretched across the top of the amphitheatre to provide shade. They would squirt the spectators with perfumed water in order to cool them down. So there are lots of added extras to these things. And this would be a way of making yourself popular in Pompeii. And indeed, even building the amphitheatre was a way of doing that. This particular amphitheatre was built um, by two of the top magistrates in Pompeii, who went by the splendid names of Gaius Quinctius Valgus and Marcus Porcius. And they built this amphitheatre uh, and we know this from an inscription which spells out not just their names, but also how they paid for it. De sua pecunia, with their own money. Now, we don't always know who designed a building like an amphitheatre, but we usually know who paid for it because it was literally writ large on the building. So these sorts of structures and what went on with them were absolutely essential, um, not just to Pompeii, but to Roman life all over the Roman Empire. And of course, if you're using these things for political and social effect, you can't put on a set of gladiatorial games that isn't as good as the one that was on last month. So the whole affair snowballs and they become more and more elaborate and more and more complicated. But as always, the Romans never lose sight of the social fabric. Augustus introduced something called the Lex Julia Theatralis, the Julian Theatre Law. And it's something we think applied to amphitheatres as well. And it meant that depending on your social status, you had to sit in a certain position in the theatre or the amphitheatre. So the posh people got the best seats at the front, the middle classes got the seats in the middle, and the slaves, and it has to be said the women also, got worst seats right up at the top. That tends to be the, the, the way that you, they're structured now in, uh, in, in big stadiums. The, the people who can, can't afford it tend to be further up the back in the nosebleeds. It still happens now. It absolutely does. Although, um, if you can afford it, you can still access the posh seats. Yes. In the Roman world, it, your status meant you, you couldn't access them. So what I'm getting from, from Pompeii is that um, while, the, while it looked different and while there wasn't as much technology, of course, as there is today, it was really the, the people themselves were a lot like the people now. There, there hasn't been a lot of change for, for how people live and how people worked. I think in many ways it's fair to say that. We've got to be a bit careful about <clears throat> imposing our modern ideas and our modern views on the ancient world. And I'm always reminded of, of the very famous opening line to the novel The Go-Between, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. And that's absolutely true. On the other hand, just every so often, we get these little insights which show us that really human nature hasn't changed that much. And the sort of ambitions we have, uh, the sort of lurks we might go to to get what we want, uh, the priorities, uh, what's important to us, perhaps hasn't changed all that much over the centuries at all. Okay, Gillian, thanks for your time. No problem. Thanks, Matt.
This lecture also runs with the Roman world, which is a subject that it runs on iTunes U, and Julian will be giving a lecture in that on a bit of the higher life in Pompeii as well. I'm Matt Smith. Thanks for your time today.